Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and has commanded us to be engaged with the words of Torah. O Lord, our God, we ask that you make the words of your Torah sweet in our mouths and in the mouths of the entire people of the greater house of Israel. May we, our descendants, and the descendants of your people of the greater house of Israel, know your name and study your Torah for its own sake. Blessed are you, O Lord. Who teaches Torah to his people. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who chose us from all the peoples and gave to us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. So this is called the Gospel according to Moses. Ooh, that sounds funny. I thought the Gospel came to take Moses out of the picture. But this is the Gospel according to Moses. Last time, in our class, we saw how the children of Israel have committed the sin that provoked Hashem to want to destroy them. <coughs> the sin of idolatry. We saw how Moshe broke the contract with Hashem. The contract was broken, smashed. We learned how Moshe pleaded for Israel, how Hashem answered Moshe's prayers for Israel by changing the premises upon which their relationship with, with the Creator was upheld. He did not change the terms of the contract, he changed the premises upon which the relationship with the Creator was, was upheld. If we don't understand that, I don't mind we talk about it at the table. It's very important to understand. So, and I called that class last week, All Israel Shall Be Saved. I called it that because the event concerning the Golden Calf at Mount Horeb taught us that through the medium of an atoning messianic figure, Moshe, and a remnant of believers, the Levites, the whole repentant country stood a chance of redemption. Through the medium of an Tony Messianic figure and a remnant of believers. And this teaches us the dynamics of redemption, not just for Israel, but for the whole world, who stands a chance at redemption through the atonement of the Messianic figure, Yeshua alongside with the remnant of believers. Paul was talking about the Jewish believers of his day. And the actually the whole greater Israel, Jewish and non-Jewish believers of his day. And this notion is valid today. Paul did that using the text in Romans 11, with the story of Elisha at Mount Horeb. <laughs> the story of the golden calf that we studied last week could be called the Gospel at Mount Horeb. It could be called the Gospel at Mount Horeb because the events that culminated from the making of the golden calf constitute the blueprint of what we call today the Gospel. It could be called the Gospel according to Moses, where redemption came through God's mercy. Think about it. What the children of Israel did that day was the natural human thing to do. What, what any of us would have done at that time I don't like when people, they go and they, they say, oh, how could they? Well, let's look at our own life, how we react even to new information that we get with the old baggage that we came with. They were just reacting to what they knew. They went to their default reaction, which we all do. So I think it would have been the same thing. We would have been Adam and Eve, we would have been the same thing too. 
they are represented of us. Impatience, disobedience, and rebelliousness are human features we still deal with today. At least I do, I don't know about you all. At least I do. Yeah. We are all prone to mistakes and disobedience <clears throat> because of our inner tendency to be impatient, to disobey, and to rebel against what we are told. It's very natural in our pride when some information comes in that we don't like, don't necessarily agree with, to just, mm. it's a natural human reaction. None of us is above what the children of Israel did that day. But their disobedience, mixed with Moshe's compassionate and redemptive leadership, created something that we human beings still need today which is which is a contract with Hashem which is not dependent on our obedience but rather dependent on his mercy on his, on his faithfulness to keep the contract in spite of our faithlessness. Though we are not faithful, he remains faithful. He's the only one who can do that. A contract that says, do I have to do That says, like he told Moshe, I will cause all my goodness to pass before you. And in your presence, I will pronounce the name of Adonai, moreover, I show, and that's what the contract says, the new contract says, I will show favor to whomever I will, I display mercy to whomever I will. What he's saying, if I want to show favor to somebody who has broken the contract, I have the right to, by the way, I'm God. I hope somebody doesn't take this and make it separate. You do, you will do that, you know. Because you will display on that, yeah. Or he can also punish somebody who didn't do anything wrong, like Job. It's his prerogative to do whatever he will. So that's what the contract, the, the new con the renewed contract, the renewed covenant says, I show favor to whomever I will, I display mercy to whomever I will. And if I want to forgive Israel because blah, 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 because of Moses, because this, because that, I can. But if our contract with Hashem is dependent on our obedience, we are doomed. And He knows that. He created us, after all, with that thing called free will. Oh my gosh. Cold trouble. So that verse that I just read is Exodus 33 19. Our contract with Him desperately needs to be dependent on his compassionate <coughs> mercies. This is a contract where Hashem has the prerogative to forgive if he wants to. It doesn't mean that we don't get punished. Oh no. But what it means is that the death penalty, which means forever separation from Hashem, is off the table. We can stay in school and keep learning. So, Lamentation 3.22 says, It is of Hashem's mercies that we are not consumed, because His compassions fail not. It is His mercy that we are not consumed, even right now, because His compassions fail not. They are not every morning, they are new every morning. Thank God we can get up in the morning and His compassion and mercy are new. Great is your faithfulness. Now, the context of that text is lamentation. Jeremiah wrote that as a lamentation, a heart cry for 
Jerusalem that was gonna burn, temple burn, everything destroyed, Israel, Judea going into captivity. And he considers that God's mercies. Because, because of everything that happened, Judea should have been destroyed and condemned to never exist again. Maybe 200 years before, give or take 50 years. The northern kingdom was, was taken captive for the for sin, because of idolatry, because of all kinds of stuff. It was taken captive, it never came back as the northern kingdom. They've been obliterated forever. Now, Jeremiah says that the southern kingdom, Jerusalem, Judea, was guilty of worse wickedness and sin than the northern kingdom. Yet what did they get? 70 years captivity in the time of this world. And a chance to come back and rebuild it again. You know? Can say, well, well, no fair. <laughs> yeah. But uh, what did he say again? I will show favor to whomever I will. I will display mercy to whomever I will. King David with Bathsheba, he deserved to die. But she made to die. Yeah, God took the child. But they were able to continue the line. Because mm, why? Because I show favor to whomever I will, I display mercy to whomever, whomever I will. Who can tell you all about it? You can try. I won't. Okay, so, but it doesn't mean we get punished, we don't get punished. But the death penalty separation, forever separation from God is off the table. So, uh, Hashem, Hashem quadrupling down on grace because we've doubled down on sin is a perfect example of Romans 5.20, which says that where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. That's what happened at the Golden Cup. It was the blueprint of what's called messianic redemption. So, and I'm not the, I, I used the term the Gospel of Mount Horan before. I'm not the first one who uses that term. Uh, yes, Hebrews 4.2, uh, like the, the author, the author where well, the author of the letter to the first century Israeli believers was the Hebrews, that's where you find that, that, that idea of the gospel at Mount Horeb. In, in that chapter, Hebrew 4, the speaking of the disobedience of the children of Israel in the desert, the author says, for good news has also been proclaimed to us. Okay, he's talking about the first century people, right? Good news has also been proclaimed to us, just at least to us to them. The them in the context is the children of Israel and Mahore in the desert. Oh, what? Maybe you're right. Yeshua dying on the cross. Like, good news was proclaimed to us as it was to them. But the message they heard came to them any good because they didn't, didn't come back in the tribe. Trust, but just the first part, that's what I'm getting into here. Those early believers understood what the Hebrew word besora. Can you say besora? Besora. What it meant. It's, it's really the word good news, which is in other places referred to as gospel. Good news, besora. Uh, there's some people who wrote a, a new. Uh, a New Testament, they call it the Besoa, which means the good news. There's a verb from that, which is going to my books. So, so the, definish, the definition of the word gospel is good news, Besoa Evangelion in Greek. So, but there is the expression that we've got to go and preach the gospel. What does it mean? First of all, I never read preach in Hebrew. It doesn't say that in Hebrew. So, so it's an English version, then it's okay. The word besoha implies to proclaim. To proclaim. Yeah, so preaching for preachers. 
Preachers can preach. They're right. They have the prerogative to preach. They're preachers. But the mandate of the disciples is to proclaim the advent of the kingdom. That's what those disciples were given as a message. Proclaim the words of the kingdom. What's the difference? Okay. Okay, here we go. This is from the dictionary. You know, English is my fourth language, so I use a dictionary sometimes. So preaching, as I was preaching, the delivery of a sermon or religious address to an assembled group of people typically in church. And then there is a, a little bit of a way that people use it. You know, the giving of a moral advice in a pompously self-righteous way. This is sometimes, it is used that way. Now, proclaim, announce officially or publicly. Announce officially or publicly. Declare something one considers important with due emphasis. You know, something like that. The a proclamation. So, uh, oh, oh, oh no, can't do that. Hope this day Okay, so a gospel. Do I have this kind of thing? Okay, a gospel. People use that word is an account of the life and teachings of Yeshua. Gospel, the word gospel might refer to the message of Yeshua, especially his offer of the renewed covenant by the sacrifice of his life. Whereas, whereas every Christian group and denomination will have various shades of differences, painting with a white paintbrush, these are what is usually understood. Preach the gospel, talk about Yeshua, what he did for us. Now, let's talk about the word gospel. Uh, let's talk about the word gospel. In the English text of the Bible, the word gospel only appears in what is called the New Testament. You can have the Bible in English. In any, in any English Bible, the word gospel only appears in the New Testament. So this leads people to erroneously believe that the gospel is something that solely pertains to the New Testament and to the issue. Because you don't... Uh, when Paul actually says the gospel of Mount Horeb, you know, it's like, well, why don't we read it before? You know, why does he need, isn't it something, something that Yeshua started 2,000 years ago? So, uh, the problem with that is that the word gospel, which is the word besora, often appears in the Old Testament. Okay? But let, let's take a tour of this. In Matthew 24, 4, 23, the word gospel appears for the first time, for the first time, with no, no explanation. It's almost like you take a New Testament and uh, you start reading, ah, a nice story. And then he says, Yeshua went teaching the synagogue, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. It just gives you that, like you're supposed to know what it means. First time that word appears in English. You can start from Genesis, it's the first time it comes in. Like it's supposed to know what it means. And the thing is, you are supposed to know what it means. Because it's an Old Testament concept. It's like the word Passover. It appears in the New Testament, but we know what it is because it's an Old Testament concept. And the word Gospel, Besora, is an Old Testament concept. So, so if you just pick the New Testament, you'd have to guess what it means. But if you are familiar with the Hebrew name word, the Soa, and read it from the Old Testament, then you understand what that means. And that gives you a total new perspective of what it means to proclaim the Besora. The Soa itself means good news. I write the verb that is related to le Vaser. Can you say le Vaser? It means that, that one verb means to proclaim the Besora. It has the idea of to proclaim. We find this word in Isaiah 52 7 in the song Manavu. My papers went away. Yeah, no, they do. So in the song Manavu, 
which says, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him who bring good news. And you can see the verb in Hebrew, mevaser. You see, I put it in a. Although I know some of you took Hebrew way or abbreviation today. And so, mevaser, that's how you, you conjugate it. And in mevaser, I proclaim the good news, I proclaim the Besoa. It's a proclamation. You know, so, uh, so basically he's saying, if we were to read it in an English thing, he's like, how beautiful on the mount are the feet of him who brings the gospel. You know, if we were consistent with the translation, that's what should be written. You know, good news, le, le le vasel, that's what it is. We also see it uh, after John was arrested. Yeshua was came into Galilee proclaiming, proclaiming the gospel of God. Again, you're supposed to know what it means. And if you read it from the Hebrews' perspective, yeah, you know what it means. This time, and saying the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. That should tell us exactly what it means to what he wants us to do when he says go and proclaim the gospel. Yeshua tells us this. this is what I like about the Bible. You never have to guess anything, it's all written down. We don't need new revelation to tell us what it says. It says it. He says it. Uh, it says, mm -hmm, okay. After John was arrested, Yeshua came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, We know what Yeshua said when he proclaimed the gospel. I think that should be our blueprint. If you ask me, I think Yeshua knows best. He says, Time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Again, gospel, good news. What did Yeshua mean? I hope I wrote it down. I thought about it. You know, so. Um, so. And I'll send a link to a little half an hour video from First School of Zion that gives you the exact study. You know, this. Uh, it's this same word, Levasseur. Is used in, in a story in first or second Kings, we remember, where Jerusalem was under attack and under siege. So the, the city was, had become so poor, it was really bad. And what the story tells us is that there were some lepers outside, three or five, I forget, five lepers. They were outside the cities because lepers live outside the city, you know. And they were starving, they couldn't count on people in Jerusalem to throw food at them, to love them. And so they were in between a rock and a hard place, Jerusalem starving, and the enemies. You know, for Assyrians, I think they were. So they, they said to themselves, hey, look, we're going to die and starve anyway. You know, we know Jerusalem can give us anything, so let's go to the enemy camp. Maybe they'll have mercy on us, maybe they'll put us in jail and they'll give us food. <laughs> You know, so keep us prisoner, at least we get food or something. They took their chance with the enemy. And when they arrived at the camp, God had done a miracle, they are all fled because blah blah blah, you can read the story. And they said, Wow, there's nobody here, there's all this food. Whoa! Hey, we won! So they go there and they start stuffing themselves with food and wine, whatever they could find, and looking for sculpture, but at this point they didn't care. You know. But, and then they say to themselves, oh, we are being really bad. It is shameful what we're doing. Here we are, providing for ourselves while the whole city is starving. There is enough stuff for the whole city here. They left everything. Let's go proclaim the good news to them that they have been saved. The word used there for them going to proclaim to Jerusalem, hey, the enemy is gone. You know, you can go and get all the food you need. Your problems are over. The city is saved. God did a miracle. That's what they were going to say. And the word used in that verse is levaser, to proclaim the good news of God's salvation. You know, so it means that there is uh, other ones. Uh, there's this one in, uh, that we read in Isaiah, where that is used. And I think there is another one, I forget. But that should give you an idea of what it means. A proclamation of deliverance 
salvation of some sort, the good news that and the proclamation of the kingdom coming is a proclamation of the, the Jewish people at that time, they equated that with healing from leprosy. They equated that with, with a, a, a restoration uh, to former goodness, like we read Kekedem, like before. You know, so it was a restoration of, of God's graces with us, something like that. It, it's got that idea. So, um, so I hope that gives you like an idea of that word that appears in, also in the uh, in the Tanakh, and I'll send a link to a little video. And if I forget, please somebody remind me. So, um, so I was talking before how the writer of the book of Hebrew compares the children of Israel on Horeb to his generation and says, "For unto us the gospel was preached." as well as unto them. But the word preached to them did not profit them nothing. So, here is another thing that the same author said of Moshe. He said, also Moshe was faithful in all God's house as a servant, giving witness to things God would do much later. Ooh. This is a Jewish teacher. If he's not Paul, it's his cousin or his brother. See if he has one. A teacher who, by anybody who reads the book of Hebrews, knows that whoever wrote it is absolutely 100% familiar with the Levitical service, with the story of Israel. With, it's a Jew, and a religious one at that, who is very knowledgeable of Leviticus and everything that people say is too boring to read. And he said that Moshe was faithful in Elphon's house as leader of King, teacher, preacher, no, no preacher. As a servant giving witness to things, as a servant giving witness to things, God would divulge later. Who? He was witness to things that God would divulge later. What this says is that the things that Moshe gave witness to are things that Hashem would divulge later. Things that we are to understand later. To me, that's another way of saying there's things that happen to them as prefigurative historical events and they were written down as a warning to us who are living in the Aharitayam. That's Paul who said that. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul takes all kinds of things that happened in the desert, lesson that the children of Israel had to learn the hard way. And what does he say about it? He says, yeah, they were so bad and we're much better, you know. No, it's not what he said. He says, this things happened to them as prefigurative historical to them. He gives a reason for, for what, why they went through that. And they were written down as a warning to us. It happened to them as prefigurative <coughs> To teach us lessons today. We're supposed to draw lessons. It, it's actually the reason why they did it for us who are living at the end of the day. That's what he is saying, not me. He says, they were written down as a warning to us. To us. It's for us they went through that. So we like parents go through something for so they can tell the children, hey, you know what? I did it. Please avoid it. So, so again, that goes with the same thing, that Moshe went, learned, did all these things, uh, giving witness to things that God would tell us later. So it's all about this later business. Okay, so what are these things he was giving witness to that Hashem would divulge later? We're going to celebrate Passover soon. When we do that, we see how the whole Passover story speaks of the events of Yeshua's crucifixion and resurrection 1400 years later. Could these events of what is called the Passion, the last, the last Seder and all that, be these things that the writer of Hebrews said Moshe gave witness to that would be divulged? Do you say divulged or divulged? <laughs> Divulge. <laughs> Depends on whether you are English. 
Oh, well, um, you know, yeah. that it would devolve to later. Could it be these things written down, like the story of the Exodus, for example? The whole story of the Exodus, which ends at Mount, which continues through Mount Horeb and ends with the entry of, into Israel. Could it be these things written down as a warning to us who are living in the Acharet HaYamin? In the, Acharet HaYamin doesn't mean the last latter day. Acharet HaYamin is the last days. And the last days start with Yeshua. That's when it starts. And the latter days we haven't seen yet. We'll see soon. Maybe later. Could this change of premises upon which Hashem rewrote his contract with the children of Israel be the blueprint of the gospel that promises us our conciliation with Hashem? Could this thing that happened with the golden calf be something that preludes and becomes the blueprint of what Yeshua does for us. Moshe pleading, atoning by taking responsibility, putting himself with the sinners, him who had sin. Yeshua, same thing. Mm. Moshe's work was not done until he brought the children of Israel to the borders of the Promised Land. In the same way, the Gospel today it's not just about redeemed, being redeemed, but also to have a place in Hashem's kingdom. The message is not just, hey, take Yeshua, be saved and live your life. You don't go to hell in the way. I heard somebody, uh, I heard somebody comparing, there's a child who wrote that, uh, some children in uh, uh, Sunday school. Says, so, yeah, Yeshua is like windshield wipers. They put the sins on that. What? Takes the sin on the like windshield wipers. <laughs> um, so, oh boy. Yes. So, the, in the same way, the gospel today is not just about redeemed, but to have a place in God, in, in the kingdom, the whole thing that. Moshe took the children of Israel of Egypt, we went through everything, we went through, it brings them to the land. That's the end result. That's the end result. So that was Moshe. Okay. Okay. So, I want to make sure I'm not like it. It fell. The concept of what the gospel is, yes, of what the gospel, mm -hmm. yes, is embedded in the four Seder cups for those who are familiar with the Seder. Moses was sent as a liberator to the Jewish nation in Egypt. He told them the good news that they could now be free and be a sovereign nation in their own place. That never happened to these people before. The question is, how does this apply to us today? That never happened to these people before. Since the days of Abraham, there had only been a nomadic tribe, that was, and that was the first one. So, here, there is the four steps of redemption. The whole message of Moses, from beginning to the end, in four steps. I know people like four minutes, so. First, redemption through the land. Second, leave Egypt. Third, receive and learn the Torah. For and to the promised land. That's the whole thing that Moshe did. That was his mission as a redeemer. He's, in Judaism, they call him the first redeemer, besides second redeemer. Not because first has been better, just chronological. The first is the foreshadow of the second. So, so we could call that the four L's. The four L's of 
Learn, live, learn, land. Make it easy to remember. Land, live, learn, land. So that's what Moshe taught, okay? So first, we have redemption through the land. Whoever you are, Jew or Gentile, if you obey Moshe and smear the blood of the land that you have kept and observed for four days in the doorpost of your house, you are redeemed for 10 days, sorry. You are redeemed from the plagues of death and the, and, no, for four days. You are redeemed from the plagues of death, the death of the firstborn. Both Israel and any, anyone in Egypt who did that was saved from the plague of the death of the firstborn. There is no other command on the Torah to observe, to get rid of. Only one. You don't even have to be of a certain genetic descent, nor social class, religious denomination, political party. Anyone who obeyed the blood of the Lamb thing could, could, could do it and be free. The message was to the whole nation. And when we say Egypt in those days, it is not just Egypt, uh, that country called Egypt. It was, it was a, it was big. It co contained a, a big part of that area. I think Ethiopia was part of it. It was, it was a world kingdom. The Sinai and all the tribes in there were part of it. But anyone who did it, who heard that message and did it, was redeemed from the plague. That's called universal redemption by the grace of Hashem. That concept is not a New Testament concept. It's a Moses, you know the guy people say Moses is taken out of the picture because of Jesus. It's a Moses concept. Universal salvation and redemption by the sole grace of Hashem by taking the lamb, doing the lamb thing. I can eat the lamb afterward, awesome. The second one was leaving Egypt. Jewish sages have equated the, the Levitical ritual of immersion slash baptism to the idea of being born again. As a child is born from inside, this is uh, what it says in Jewish texts, as a child is born from inside a world sack, they say that people immerse in order to emerge and be born again, new creature of God. Immersion and baptism has more to do, as to do the, has to do with conversion from paganism to the worship of one God, from a state of sin to a renewed state, from a state of, uh, of ritual uncleanliness to ritual cleanliness. It's always about death and rebirth, death and rebirth from something. You know, that's what really what it's all about. Born again, that's what it's all about. So, uh, and this principle mostly applied to repentance, repentance from a station of sin, you know, which is teshuva, teshuva means repentance, a total change of lifestyle from willful disobedience to striving to obedience, and conversion of Gentilism to Judaism. Okay, that's what it was about. It was the basis behind the born again conversation between Yeshua and Nicodemus in John 3. Paul uses that principle in 1 Corinthians 10, saying, For brothers, I don't want you to miss the significance of what happened to our fathers. You know, 1 Corinthians 10, when he says these things happened to them prefiguratively to teach us something, right? That's what he says. I don't want you to miss the significance of what happened to our fathers. All of them were guided by the pillar of God, of cloud. And they all passed through the sea. And in connection with the cloud and with the sea, they, were, they all immersed themselves into Moshe. They, got, they were baptized into Moshe. That's the word there. Why into Moshe? If you keep reading the text, it says, after all this, they were on the other side and the Egyptians were drowned. And they were finally free with the sea between them and Egypt. They were, that's the moment they were born into the nation of Israel. From that moment they left Egypt. Sinai was still Egypt. They were born into the nation of Israel at that very moment. And it says, and the people believed in, Mo in, in God and in Moses' his servant. Just like we say, we believe in God and Yeshua the Messiah in the name of. They saw what God was doing through Moses. 
It's, it's, it's the same idea. So, the crossing of the Red Sea provided a repentance element for both Jew and Gentile who left Egypt, and an option to conversion for the Gentile. They crossed the Red Sea, they become a new nation, they will become Israel. Third one. The third step is learn the Torah. Now they were a new nation, they couldn't use Egypt's legislation. They needed their own legislation. So we like America across the sea, they came here. They, they kept a lot of England stuff. There was a lot of England stuff in our <coughs> government, but they needed their own. And England told them one time, look, until you have a constitution, you're not a country. And this is why uh, John Adams <coughs> got together the Constitutional Convention to make the, to the Constitution that's what made them a country. Now Israel needed that. <coughs> they couldn't use the Egyptian style of government. Hashem wanted them to be a new nation run by His words, so they could model it to the rest of the world. They also needed to learn how to worship Hashem, who delivered them. He didn't want the style of Egyptian worship. They couldn't use the form of worship they had learned in Egypt, they, so they needed to go to Mount Horeb to meet Hashem. They could have arrived in, in Canaan in, in less than two weeks from Goshen to. They had done it before the death of Jacob when they all brought Jacob. They should have stayed there. I think this was Jacob's trick. I don't want to die here. I want you to bring me over there. It was a trick to remind them you're not supposed to stay here. But he died. They needed to learn the legislation of the kingdom. This, legis this legislation is found in the word of the oracles pronounced and not already, which we call the Torah. Four, enter the land. Conquer and to populate the land. This is the final step. In Hebrews 3 and 4, this step is associated with the final resurrection, which we all partake together. No one resurrect ahead or behind schedule. As Paul said, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, Paul well, is right here. It will take but a moment, the blink of an eye, as the final shofar, final shofar. For the shofar will sound and the dead will be raised to live forever and we too, the alive, will be changed. We all go there together. So let's take, now this is the Moshe story. Let's see how it applies for us today. Um, we learned before that the things Moshe witnessed were, were about the things that Hashem would divulge later. For example, some of these things are the principles of redemption, which are by numbers for the Israelite for humanity. Paul also mentioned that the things that happened to Israel were to teach us today. How would these four elements of redemption look today. So here are four steps. Well, okay. many people took the land. Many people take the land. You know, hey, believe. He said it, right? That's coming. Believers understand that the redemption starts with the land. There is no redemption without the land. The land anybody can take, no condition, you know. It takes away the lamb which takes away the sin of the world, Yeshua. That's easy. People do that easily, right? Same thing. Second, oh no, second is a bit more is a bit more difficult. Leave Egypt. Leave Egypt means leave your old life. Leave your old friends. Leave your old style of entertainment. Leave your old modus operandi, maybe, I don't know. The world. Yeah, the world. Now that's difficult. Many Jews did not leave Egypt. There's only a remnant left. Some people have read one time 10%, I don't know who was there, but Many stayed, and Egypt has always had a very, very, very copious Jewish community. That's why, that's why the parents of Yeshua went there. They went to the Jewish community in Egypt, you know, to find refuge. There was a place called Elephantine Island. I think there was a 
a model of the temple. You can still see the ruins. You can look for it in Google. So now people understand the lamb. Yeah, I'll take the lamb. Leaving Egypt, uh, well, but let's say some leave Egypt. I'll leave Egypt, yeah. I'm all, I'm all out there. So many people take the land, but don't leave Egypt. You know, don't leave the world. <coughs> it's easier to take the believer out of Egypt than to take Egypt out of the believer. What's our Egypt? The Egypt that keeps us from fulfilling Hashem in the desert of uncertainty to receive his unadulterated world. Un unadulterated world. What is an Egypt in us? So the next step is where, where we lose a lot of people. Learn Torah. Oh, learn Torah. Taking the analogy of this children of Israel to today, most people who have acknowledged Yeshua and have even immersed it into a new life, they left Egypt, but they do not go to Mount Hor. They don't. They actually don't go there because they've been told they don't need to. They can skip that stage. Some people believe they can go straight from the land to the promised land. Or they can, yeah, land, leave Egypt, promised land. There is a step that requires you. And, you. and if you're somebody who's very organized, you say, I need to go from A to B. So, right? And God says, no, go there, 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 that there is a new <clears throat> dispensation and the step to go to Horan is now obsolete. That the words Hashem spoke at Mount Horan are obsolete. It sounds terrible to even say. The word of God, obsolete. Okay. That the words that Moses received from Hashem face to face are obsolete. Think about it. So now we have a whole bunch of people who stay in Egypt or even are stuck in the desert because we don't skip rates. We don't. To go to the fourth step, we must go first to second and third. You don't go from first base to fourth base. You go from first base, second base, third base, fourth base. Right? Right. Only after we have learned from Hashem. Do we go to the land? I mean, when I came to the States in 1995, I had to go through medical ex exam after medical exam. They checked every hole in my body from head to toe. They sure didn't want to bring disease into America. <clears throat> then, then I had to get police reports from every country I had been in since the age of 16. There was about 16 countries. And I was in Thailand, supposed to find the embassy, consulate, everyone. So, they sure didn't want to bring a criminal to America. Then I arrived, they gave me a green card. It's actually pink. Being a little color right didn't make any difference to me. <laughs> right at home with a pink green card. You know? So, as they gave me my pink green card, the person gave me a questionnaire with 200 questions about America's history. Politi about America's political system and American understanding of American wars in the world and why did we drop well, the, the atom bomb and all that. They also gave me the correct answers for that. <laughs> I was not allowed to make my own. When I would come to the courthouse five years later, they asked me five questions at random. And I had to take a small English test, like a writing a proper sentence in English. And I passed the deep pass the test I knew English already. So. And then they had to put me in front of a flag and they asked me to swear. I said I didn't know any swear words. <laughs> so they said I needed to swear allegiance to the flag, which I did. But even though I didn't know any swear words, I didn't make a mistake. 
So if you come to a country of this world, I have to learn about its language, its legislation, its history, and swear obedience to its principles, why wouldn't it be the same for the people who come to the kingdom of God? Why wouldn't we need to learn its language, its legislation, its history, and swear obedience to its principles? <clears throat> but no, people are told they don't have to. They can just come as they are from Egypt, bring their baggage. But I'm very happy today to see that many people like you who come to their senses, you know, left Egypt and have come to Mount Horeb to learn the Torah. Because we don't skip grade in this course. And what we don't learn today, we'll have to learn later. There's no way out of it. And the people who don't want to learn it today, we who are learning it today will teach them. That's what we're doing today. Personally, when I come here and we do service and, and teach and all that, that's what I'm thinking. I'm teaching, telling you, helping you for your job of tomorrow. We need teachers. This is why we need to learn all we can do. I believe this is what the millennium will be about. We'll be bringing the rest of the world into connection. And we're preparing today for that time. I believe it. You know, there's a verse that says in the Bible, the students are many, but the teachers are few. Pray for the Lord to raise teachers for his students. Actually, is that how the verse goes? Workers. <laughs> Workers, not students. Ah, okay. <laughs> yes. May we be a voice in the desert calling others to come to the mountain of the God of Jacob to learn all his ways. Amen. Amen. And my Father, that's our prayer for today. We can learn all we can today um, so we can be the worthy teachers, worthy and adequate teachers of tomorrow. Hashem Yeshua Mashiach. <laughs>